Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this first event held by the Yale University Baltic Studies Program in this 2021-2022 academic year. My name is Bradley Woodworth, um, and I coordinate the program. Today, we're very glad to have with us Dr. Una Bergmane, who joins us from Helsinki. Thank you very much, uh, Una, for, for being here. Uh, it's, it's late for you, and um, we're, we're just really grateful that you could be here. <sighs> Dr. Bergmane is easily the most important scholar working on the topic of US and Soviet diplomacy and the Baltic movements for autonomy and then independence. I'm very sorry we can't be here together in person. Uh, and I hope we can begin our in-person events that we've held now for a number of years very soon. So now, late September, we're just barely over a month past the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the USSR and the renewed independence for Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. And I'm really very glad that with this event, we can mark that anniversary. Ona Bergmane is a postdoctoral researcher at Helsinki University. She holds a PhD from Sciences Po Paris. She's been here in New Haven before as a Fox International Fellow at Yale, a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University and a teaching fellow at the London School of Economics. Dr. Bergmane has published several articles and book chapters in English, French and German analyzing the Baltic drive for independence from an international and transnational perspective. Her most recent articles appeared in the Journal of Cold War Studies and the International History Review. Her forthcoming book, Politics of Uncertainty, the US, the Baltic Question and the Collapse of the USSR is due out from Oxford University Press in 2022. We're so very glad that she could be here to speak with us today. And the title of her remarks follows that of her very much anticipated book, which I just mentioned, Politics of Uncertainty, the US, the Baltic Question, and the Collapse of the Soviet Union. So after Dr. Bergman's remarks, we will have time for Q&A. Um, as we've done in the past, you can post your questions in the Q&A function um, here in Zoom. So, uh, so please do so, and we'll take them in the order uh, that they were received. Um, so, Una, thank you. Thank you again very, very much for being here with us. And uh, the time is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Bradley. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here uh, and I'm very thankful for this opportunity to talk about my research. Um, so, um, as Bradley mentioned, my book is, 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 is um, hopefully coming out. The plan is that it will appear in 2022. Um, and so there is still a little bit of time. I'm doing the final edit. Uh, there is a little bit of time uh, and a little bit of space in the manuscript, uh, so um, to improve my work. So I'm very, um, I'm very uh, keen uh, to hear your feedback and your questions. But I will first start by explaining what the book is about and what are the big questions that I'm asking um, in this research. I will share now my screen so that you can see my PowerPoint. Um, and so the book, um, yeah, as I said, I will briefly explain what the book is about and I will share a couple of answers that I have to those questions I'm asking in this research. So this book is first and foremost, a book about the interplay between international and domestic dynamics in the process of the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And I'm looking specifically at the way how the United States and the Soviet Union try to deal with the so-called Baltic question. I'm looking specifically at the time period between 1989 and 1991, but of course in the manuscript I refer to the events that took place uh, before 1989 to give the historical background. But the heart of the research, the core of, of the book are these three crucial years in uh, history of the Soviet Union. Um, so I will say a couple of words uh, about the historiography, uh, just to show you where do my questions come from. So as you know, probably, there is a lot already written about the international and internal causes of the Soviet collapse. The debate has been ongoing since 1991. But there have been only very few works that have made the connection between the international and internal causes of the Soviet collapse. 
Usually, these two questions, the international impact upon the Soviet stability and the domestic unrest, have been analyzed separately. There are exceptions, such as the works of Mark Kramer, Christina Spohr, Sergei Plokhi, and there are a couple of others. And this is the line of thought that I try to follow in my work. But most of the existing literature projects an image of uh, nationalist mobilization in the Soviet Union being a purely domestic phenomenon. And it gives an impression that Moscow was still the gatekeeper between the West and other Soviet actors during the, the, the time of, of the, the years of perestroika. So that was not really the case. And to introduce the case that I'm looking at, the, the case of the Baltic states, I would like to read you a quote um, from something that Mikhail Gorbachev said in late 1989. Um, he was reporting to the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And he said, active attempts are being made to internationalize the so-called Baltic issue. A provocative appeal is being organized to the United Nations, the European Parliament, with a request to put pressure on Soviet leadership. They knock at the American embassy in Moscow at the White House. Emissaries of Sayudis, so Sayudis was the Lithuanian independence movement, and various political groupings systematically travel abroad for this purpose even trying to conduct official political and economic negotiations on behalf of their people. So in the case of the Baltic countries, we can talk about very active attempts to reach out to the international community. Um, we can talk about a strong transnational network, which consisted of connections between Baltic independence movements pro-independent governments that came to power after the elections of 1990, and the Baltic diaspora, mostly in the US, but also in Sweden, also in Canada, and to a certain extent also in Britain. And we see contacts at the highest level between the US and uh, European officials and these pro-independent governments in Tallinn, in Riga, and in Vilnius. And these are contacts at the highest level in the sense that they were received at the White House, they were received at the Elizabeth Palace, they were received in London, in Bonn, in the Scandinavian capitals, and so on and so forth. So what Mikhail Gorbachev was here um, rightly concerned about was the diffusion of power to a certain extent. For 50 years, Moscow was the main official Moscow had the power to represent the Baltic countries on the international level. There were Baltic diaspora, there, was, uh, there were uh, Baltic um, diplomats in exile who were contesting. Uh, Moscow tries to do so, but basically Moscow was perceived by the, the, the international community as the representative of the interests of the peoples of the Soviet Union, and Baltic countries de facto were perceived as being part of the Soviet Union. So during the years of perestroika, Gorbachev and the leadership of the Soviet Union sees the emergence of other players coming from Vilnius, from Riga, from Tallinn, and claiming the sovereign right to represent the interests of the Baltic people at the international level. And if we think about the components of statehood, capacity to establish international context, capacity to conduct diplomatic relations with other countries, is one of these four key components of statehood. So when we talk about Baltic outreach to the international community, we talk about attempts of affirmation of sovereignty, claims to statehood. Then we have to look at uh, what else was said on that day, uh, December 25th, 1989. And here we see that Gorbachev continued. Um, he said, However, it has to be said objectively that in the West, this is perceived with certain caution. And they, the West, they dissociate themselves from such attempts. 
such attempts to draw them into political games. So what Gorbachev is saying here is that, well, yes, we have to be concerned by these Baltic attempts to conduct foreign policy while being part of the Soviet Union. But at the same time, we can reassure ourselves that in the West, the Western government, they are looking at these Baltic attempts with great caution. So this is basically what my book is about. It is a book about the Soviet attempts to struggle with the power diffusion, um, with this loss of legitimacy and agency over what was happening in the Baltic states and what the Baltic uh, governments were doing internationally. This is a book about Baltic attempts to reach out to the international community and Baltic struggles with invisibility, their attempts to be visible, to be recognized on the international level. And this is a book about the uh, American response to these uh, dynamics. And one of the main arguments of the book is that the American response to these dynamics was very much driven by uncertainty. So if we look now more closely at these three components of my book, uncertainty, invisibility, and power diffusion. So if we think about the American uncertainty, um, and if we think a little bit about how the story of the end of the Cold War has usually been written, then we see that basically both the memoirs of the, of the actors of the time and also most of the scholarship has written the narrative is built around the idea of American agency. What I try to do in this book is to show the other side of the story, uh, to show the limits of American agency, the limits that were imposed by the uncertainty. So I try to explain in the book that the change taking place in the Soviet Union was overwhelming, not just for the Soviets and Eastern Europeans, but also for the rest of the international community, including the, the, the US. Bush administration, initially in 1999, when Bush uh, became the president of the United States, replacing uh, Ronald Reagan, he initially mistrusted Gorbachev and worried that Gorbachev might use force to stop the democratic changes in Eastern Europe. When after the fall of the Berlin Wall, it became clear that Soviet president did not intend to do so, then the White House continued to worry, and for a reason, they continued to worry about other possible disasters that could come upon the Soviet Union, such as, for example, the fall of Gorbachev or reversal of perestroika by a military dictatorship, or reversal of perestroika by Gorbachev himself. They worried about the collapse of the Soviet Union and what could come with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union. civil wars, nuclear proliferation, and economic crisis, and so on and so forth. So this uncertainty about the future of the Soviet Union, the future of Mikhail Gorbachev, this uncertainty made the, the, the White House uh, very unwilling to be actively engaged first in the democratization process uh, in Eastern Europe in 1989, then later they would become more present um, on the ground. But in 1989, we see a great prudence, a, a very cautious attitude uh, at the White House. And the same with the Baltic question. Uh, the United States were very reluctant in 1989, but also in 1990, 1991, to be actively involved with the Baltic question. German unification was a completely different story. That was the, the, the top priority on uh, the US international agenda at the end of the Cold War. And this is the point where the White House is willing to risk and to put pressure on Mikhail Gorbachev to obtain German unification, which would be beneficial for the interests of the, of the, of the West. So the uncertainty and then also the pressure to handle the best possible way, the German unification, as I said, made the White House very careful regarding the situation in the Soviet Union, but also uh, especially in the Baltic countries. Then there were other factors, other elements that pushed uh, the White House to take a stronger stand on the Baltic issue. 
And first and foremost, it was the tradition of the non-recognition. So as probably uh, many of you know, in 1940, when the Baltic countries were uh, occupied and annexed by the Soviet Union, the West, first the US and then most of the European countries, did not recognize this annexation as legal. So in the eyes of the West during the Cold War, the Baltic countries were not legally part of the Soviet Union. But that was obviously in the eyes of the West, in the eyes of the Baltic diaspora. Well, for the Soviet Union, the Baltic countries were an integral part of the USSR. So the non-recognition policy as a diplomatic tradition, and also the pressure from the US Congress. And here we can really see the impact of the Baltic diaspora. There was about 1 million strong diaspora, mostly consisting of Lithuanians, but also Estonians and Latvians, that was very active. It was not a, a, a huge diaspora, but it was a very well organized and rich diaspora. Um, that was that had very good connections with the US Congress, both uh, members of the Congress from the Democrat Party and from the Republican Party. Um, and so we can really see between 1989 and 1991, a strong pressure, bipartisan pressure from the Congress, uh, pushing the White House to take a more active, a more a stronger stand regarding the, 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 the Baltic uh, situation. So the combination of this uncertainty and the domestic pressures, it led uh, the White House uh, between 1989 and 1991 to conduct a rather contradictory policy regarding the Soviet Union and the Baltic question uh, specifically. And I will give you a couple of examples, but there are many more. For example, so the White House supported Gorbachev and Perestroika, but refused to provide large scale economic assistance to the Soviet Union. The US, the White House claimed to support the integrity of the Soviet Union, but then argued that three of the Soviet republics, so the Baltic republics, should in principle become independent, and the White House, the, the George Bush, uh, received the leaders of the Baltic states in the White House, already before the recognition of independence. Bush claimed that he was not willing to interfere in the domestic affairs of the Soviet Union, but then it, he did threaten the Soviet Union twice uh, with economic sanctions regarding the situation in the Baltic countries. The United States officially congratulated Lithuania when Lithuania proclaimed its independence. So Lithuania was the first Soviet Republic to, to proclaim independence uh, in spring uh, 1990. Um, so the White House congratulated uh, Lithuania, but at the same time, uh, there was no international recognition of the restoration of, international, of, of, of Lithuania's independence at that point. And behind the scenes, the White House supported the idea that uh, Lithuanian declarations should be suspended uh, to give a time and place for negotiations with the Soviet Union. And Bush asked Baltic diaspora activists who he received at the White House not to put too much pressure on Gorbachev. But then when it came to the German unification, uh, the United States did not hesitate to put pressure on Gorbachev um, especially regarding the question of German uh, membership, in, uh, the, the membership of United Germany in NATO. And there are other examples like this. But we can see one consistent element in the uh, United States policy regarding the Baltic question. And that one consistent element was the repeated continuous request not to use force in the Baltic countries. This is something that comes up in almost every single conversation that George Bush had with Gorbachev about the Baltic question, or that uh, Jim Baker had with Edward Shevardnadze uh, regarding the situation in the Baltic countries. There was this constant insistence that the use of force would be the, the red line for the, for the United States. And the idea was that the United States wanted to diffuse the tensions between Moscow and Vilnius, or between Moscow and Riga or Tallinn, before these tensions escalate to violence, before this becomes an international issue, that would then uh, affect negatively the relations between Moscow and, uh, and, and, and Washington. And that was something that, that, that uh, Bush tried to explain repeatedly to Gorbachev that if there was a major crisis in the Baltic countries, then the pressure coming from the US Congress 
would be so strong that uh, that Bush uh, would not be able to have any flexibility regarding his relations with with the with the USSR. That that, that had to be in that case there would be uh, some sort of consequences uh, for for these relations. But the the main idea, the, 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 what, what the White House was trying to do at the time was to put these pressures on the Soviet Union to request not to use force, but to do in some sort of a discreet way, to using the back channels, uh, using diplomatic communication. Bush wrote private letters about this uh, to Mikhail Gorbachev, but there wasn't a, an idea that this should not be done publicly, not to humiliate Gorbachev, not to manifest some sort of an open interference in, in Soviet affairs. And this idea that the Baltic question should be handled uh, with, with, with the, the public visibility of, of the question should be reduced, that was something that went very much against what the Baltic countries wanted. The Baltic countries at the time, the pro-independence governments and the independence movements, they were aiming at acquiring as much international visibility as possible. And the idea behind this was that the leadership in the Baltic countries did not really believe uh, that Moscow would willingly let Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania to leave the Soviet Union. And so it seemed that independence could be achieved only through internationalization of the Baltic question, that the answer to the Baltic question would come somehow from the West. So here we see, and it's quite interesting to see that in, in the legal scholarship, legal, legal scholars, they, they debate, there are debates about what does this act of international recognition mean? Is this only a way to acknowledge that these countries have met the, 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 uh, the requirements for statehood and thus they are states? Or, and this is the constitutive school uh, of, of, of these legal debates that claims that international recognition is more than just an acknowledgement. It is an active participation in the creation of statehood. That international recognition consolidates um, the independence, especially in contested situations, just like the situation uh, at the time between the Baltic countries and the Soviet Union. So, and this is how the, the, the Baltic governments perceive the situation, and this is especially how diaspora, Baltic diaspora in the US perceive the situation. That there has to be an active participation of the international com community in the consolidation of the Baltic state. And meanwhile, the argument, not just in the White House, not just in Washington, but also in, in, in Bonn, in London, in Paris, was that First, it has to be consent. The Baltic countries have to acquire consent from Mikhail Gorbachev, from the Soviet Union. And only then, when this independence is negotiated with Moscow, only then uh, there can be uh, an international recognition. And in the Baltic perspective, the recognition was not just a legal act. It was first and foremost, but it was also um, an attempt to obtain this international affirmation of internally forged identity. The, the, the affirmation as some form of a recognition of the existence uh, of, the, of the Baltic nations and an affirmation of the Europeanness of the, uh, of, the, of the Baltic nations, an affirmation that they are part of this international community which they, uh, they, 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 they uh, had been part of uh, in the interwar period. And in this, in this context, so the West became this significant other that, that had to test and testify the existence of the Baltic countries. And it became especially important in, in case of Estonia and Latvia, where in the late 80s, during the last years of the of the late socialism, you really see in the in Estonian Latvian case, uh, a bit less in Lithuanian case, these ontological fears about the future existence of the collective self, which was the Estonian nation or the or the Latvian nation, and these ontological fears they came to some extent from their experience uh, with the Soviet modernity, and mostly 
from uh, the, um, the, 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 it was a result of the large influx of uh, migrants from other Soviet republics, which was perceived as a forced justification because you, you have the number of ethnic Latvians, and Liter Liter uh, Estonians, uh, the percentage of ethnic uh, Estonians, Latvians uh, dramatically uh, reduced uh, over the course of the, of the, in the time frame between 60s and the, and 80. So this ontological sphere was a large, to very large extent, a driving force, uh, not just of the independence movement as such, but also to this international outreach. At the end of the day, the Baltic countries, in that sense, they obtained to some extent what they wanted in August 1991. They are recognized um, as uh, sovereign states. The restoration of the independence is recognized by the international community. And at the end of August, early September, there is still an idea which is very strong, both in Moscow and in Washington and in European capitals, that the Baltic states are and are going to be some sort of an exception in the Soviet context. That the Baltic countries will become independent, but the rest of the Union will find some sort of bondus vivendi that will be some sort of a reformed Union in which uh, other republics will take part. Um, and the Baltic countries did manage to, to obtain the, the, the highest international visibility among the Soviet republics. So then if we look at um, the Soviet struggles with the power diffusion, um, we see the connection between the international and the domestic in this sense. The power diffusion took place from the party to the state, and the, the, quite a lot of that has been written about this. Um, and it was just, it was an intentional move by Mikhail Gorbachev to take the power, not entirely, but to a large extent, away from the party and re-enable the state institutions. But this then, of course, and it was supposed to happen, it did happen through democratization. The problem was the unexpected result of this power uh, of this of the shift transfer of power uh, or equilibration of power between party and the state. It was partially it, it led also to a power diffusion from center to the periphery. And why? Well, because as we know, the Soviet Union consisted of 15 republics, and these 15 republics did have their own institutions. However, during the, the, the largest part of the history of the Soviet Union, these Republic institutions had a rather minimal role, which was to some extent performative, to some extent symbolic, and then it had some limited agency, but this agency was, as I said, rather limited. And now in the context of perestroika, these, these Republic institutions, through democratization, through free elections, they gain more and more agency and legitimacy. And so this power diffusion, it was, this, the Soviet leadership found itself unable to stop these processes because in order to stop this loss of power, um, in order to stop it, that also the democratization process should have been stopped. Uh, because it was driving force behind these processes. Um, and it could be done through massive use of, of, of physical force. For example, the, if, if, if we think about the Baltic situation. But the force was not used, at least to a large scale, except, um, well, we have three, three, on three occasions um, in, in Baku and in, in Tbilisi and then in Vilnius and Riga. But these were... Uh, rather um, separated occasions. And so we don't have this, this, this massive uh, large scale use of force that the, 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 uh, the, the White House uh, feared uh, all through these years. So why it didn't happen? Um, there are different answers to this. A lot has been written about Gorbachev's personal aversion to the use of force, which was true. He, he was not uh, very keen on, on, on using force against civilians. But we also have to think about the role of external and internal pressures not to use force. So the external and the internal pressures, the internal ones came 
from the Russian Democrats, but they came also from the closest circles of Mikhail Gorbachev, from people like Yakovlev, like Chernayev. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there was a strong pressure coming uh, from the White House not to use force in the Baltic countries. Um, and this can be explained, this insistence, this internal and external insistence upon the, 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 uh, the uh, this insistence that, that there should be no uh, large scale violence in the Baltic countries or in the Soviet Union in general. It came from uh, the connection that was made between, and the connection was made by Mikhail Gorbachev himself, between perestroika um, as a project of, of reforms in the Soviet Union and the absence of the use of force uh, in domestic politics or international politics. So basically a possibility of the use of force in the Soviet Union was perceived as that would be the end of perestroika. And we see this in 1991 uh, when, when uh, force is used uh, in uh, Vilnius and in Riga, um, then we see uh, the, the both domestic outrage and international outrage and both of them um, are driven uh, by, um, by this fear that this might be the, the end of perestroika. So then the, the, uh, the role of the international community and especially the US, um, it was, this role was reinforced by the fact that the, the, the international community had to answer two questions. They had to answer the question, who has the power to represent the three Baltic countries? Who has the legitimate power? Who are we going to receive? With whom we are going to talk about the future of the Baltic states? Um, and the decision was that these pro-independent governments are, they have the capacity to represent the Baltic countries even before the international recognition. So that is why before the, the, the international recognition, we see uh, the, the leadership of, of the Baltic countries uh, visiting uh, the White House, uh, visiting uh, Paris, Bonn, and, and London. Um, and this obviously had an impact on the, on, the, on the relations between Moscow and the Baltic capitals. And the other question that the international community had to answer was who had the power to decide if and when Moscow recognizes the independence of the Baltic states? And this question became especially important in August 1991, when Boris Yeltsin, as the president of, 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 Russian, uh, uh, of, of the Russian Republic, moved towards the recognition of the Baltic independence a week before Mikhail Gorbachev. And this week is crucial uh, in, the, well, in the history of the Soviet Union, but also in the, especially in the history of the, of the Baltic countries. Uh, because this is the time when the Western governments were trying to understand and to decide who is in charge in Moscow and whose decision should be taken into account. And so, as we know, what happened was that it was Yeltsin's decision to recognize the independence of the Baltic state that opened the gates to the international recognition. And the United States were the one country that was waiting for the whole week expecting and hoping that first there will be a recognition by Mikhail Gorbachev and then the White House was planning to recognize the Baltic states. But because Mikhail Gorbachev was hesitating and because the pressure was, was rising uh, domestically in the US, then on uh, September uh, the 2nd, uh, George Bush recognized the restoration of Baltic independence and then the Soviet Union did it on uh, September 6th. So if we think about my overall conclusions in the book, um, so before I move to, to, to my main uh, conclusion about the role that the international actors played in the Soviet collapse, um, I think something that has to be uh, mentioned is that we see uh, this hierarchical approach to national aspirations at the end of the Cold War um, and this is not something new. We have seen it at, at, at many points um, uh, in the international history of the 20th century, that state recognition is never just simple acknowledgement uh, that a certain political entity has met the, the criteria of statehood. It is always a political decision that produces and reproduces the hierarchies of international relations. 
And some claims made in the name of right of self-determination are judged more legitimate than others, and the criteria uh, is always uh, subjective. Um, and we see very clearly this hierarchy in, uh, at the end of the Cold War. The German national aspirations are judged to be legitimate, and the United States and the international community is willing to actively participate in making them a reality, these national aspirations. Um, in the case of the Baltic countries, Baltic uh, aspirations are judged to be legitimate, but there is no willingness to be actively engaged with this problem. And then when it comes to the national aspirations of other Soviet republics, they are not perceived as legitimate and there is no active uh, international involvement. So my last point, so what was then the role of um, the um, international actors in the, in the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union? So the main battle for the Estonian, Latvian and Lithuanian independence, it did take place inside the Soviet borders. However, this visibility that the Baltic countries gained uh, on the international level was an important advantage uh, to Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, because it helped them to both make allies with the Russian Democrats. And it's a very interesting question. I didn't have uh, time to really dwell on it, but we can discuss it uh, during our question and answer session. So this alliance between Russian Democrats and the Baltic um, independence movements, Baltic pro-independence governments, it was forged not only, but also because of this international visibility that the Baltic countries had. Um, and this international visibility also helped uh, to dissuade the enemies of the Baltic independence who came from the conservative circle, because it made the use of force in the Baltic states much more complicated. This international interest in the Baltic situation, not just from the government, but also from the civil societies, also from the media. Um, so the main stage of the Soviet final power struggle was the Soviet Union itself. So it was not, it did not happen somewhere else. The Soviet Union collapsed in the Soviet Union. But the international community was some sort of an audience for this confusing play, which was the power struggle in the Soviet Union. But instead of being just spectators, the United States and also European countries or the so-called West, um, they did influence the actors who were participating in the Soviet power struggle just by being there, just by their mere presence. So the outside regard upon the Soviet internal dynamics was crucial because actors who were involved in the Soviet power struggle, they did act and they react they reacted and acted towards each other, keeping in mind the presence of this external gaze. Um, so why was this um, external gaze uh, important for the, for the Soviet actors? We see Gorbachev and his circles, we see Yeltsin and Russian Democrats, we see Baltic independence activists and Baltic uh, uh, pro-independence governments, that they were trying to project an image of conformity with Western normative expectations to the outside world. On one hand, and it is an important question that I uh, try to discuss in the book, the idea of Europeanness, whatever that word means, that all these actors have their own understanding, what does it mean? But this idea of Europeanness was a key element in both perestroika project um, and in Baltic nationalism. And at the same time, this international legitimacy that they were all trying to obtain was a political capital that Gorbachev, Yeltsin, and Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanians, they were trying to obtain in order to better position themselves in these internal power struggles. So that was like a very brief overview of uh, the book. But, um, I am very interested in what questions or what kind of feedback you might have. 
So yeah, thank you very much. Well, Una, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, many really fascinating ideas I've been writing the whole time. Um, uh, and, uh, but let's, uh, let's move to questions. So if you will please post your questions in the, the Q&A, um, then we will move to those. And we've got, uh, we've got plenty of time. So um, I look forward to receiving those. Uh, as we're waiting, uh, so Una, a, a number of questions I have. One has to do with, well, let's see. Okay, um, we've got, um, I will bring my questions in last. I want to make sure everybody. Has a chance. So I thought we just had one. But, um, so yeah, uh, so please, uh, if you go down, if you've got a question, go down in that bar in, in Zoom where it says Q&A and, and type your questions right in there. And then we will, uh, all of us uh, here on the panel will be able to, all, Una and I will be able to see them. Uh, as well as those uh, helping us in, in the Macmillan Center. So you know, one, one question I have, um, do, do you, did you see any uh, evidence in documents that you've used um, in, in, in your research in preparing this book that there was awareness within the White House about how other countries may read to a Soviet collapse? You, you describe how the Baltic, uh, through this external gaze, uh, rose very high hierarchically, um, but a Soviet, surely they knew in the White, in, in Washington, the White House, that, that a, uh, the conditions that would allow this, the Baltic states to become, the Baltic republics to become independent would, would uh, be concomitant with, with similar, um, with other republics also becoming independent. And then in, in immediately that would be issues involving China, right? Um, and other parts of the world were, was there aware of how international this whole issue would, would be? Well, this is a very interesting question because um, I, I see very clearly that the, the Baltic game is to a certain extent worked because the Baltic countries at the beginning, they were hesitating between making their claims universal, saying that they are claiming independence in the name of uh, people's rights to self-determination or making themselves a specific case, saying that they are an exceptional case in the Soviet context and that they want to become independent and they have the rights to independence because Soviet actions in 1940 were illegal and so the Soviet power is illegal in the, in, in, in the Baltic Republic. And so this was the argument that was chosen by the Baltic independence movement, by the diaspora. And we can see how the White House embraces this idea more and more in the time between 1989 and 1991. And we see very clearly in the spring uh, 1991, Grant Scottcroft, who is the national security advisor of, 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 of George Bush, he writes very explicitly to George Bush that at some point we will have to say publicly that we recognize the Soviet Union in the 30s in certain, with certain borders. And that these borders we recognize until this day and then there is the exception of the Baltic countries. And we will have to say publicly that we recognize the independence of the Baltic countries, that they are an exception, but the rest of the Soviet Union should remain the way it was in the 30s when we recognized the... the... So the impact upon other Soviet republics or other countries of the world, it is supposed to be limited because the Baltic case then becomes this exception that should not be a precedent to something larger. Well, I have some, I have, uh, I'd like to follow up, but, but maybe I'll come back to that. So we, we have one question here in the Q&A. Um, and again, I, I see that some of you are putting your questions in the chat. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll get to that, but please let me encourage you to put the Q&A, your questions in the Q&A function. Um, so one question we have is how critical are the very active Baltic immigrant communities in the US to positions in, in the Bush administration. So y you've answered that, and, and maybe one one twist for that would be: How would you evaluate um, the the relative importance to the in immigrant communities and their political elected political representatives in Congress, and the non recognition um, from earlier in the twentieth century? Uh, how 
how would you uh, prioritize those two pressures? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. What was more important? Um, they are so interlinked that it's, I think that, well, the knowledge recognition policy was a rhetorical device during the Cold War. It was a, a legal construct. Um, but then it became meaningful first when the Baltic countries started to claim independence and then when Baltic diaspora, with the help of the members of the Congress, started to require from the White House to have an actual substance of the policy, when they were starting to say that, well, we said this for 50 years, so now there has to be some sort of action that, that, that is consequential to this, to this, uh, to this, uh, this policy. But the Baltic uh, diaspora, um, it played an important role in two ways. So one was what I already mentioned um, through uh, the cooperation with the Congress, their connections with the Congress and Congress. So then I could also explain what Congress did at the time. Um, what Congress did was they were basically taking very active public stands, both through, um, through voting, declarations that were supposed to put pressure on the White House didn't have legal consequences, but there's basically this declarative statement. Um, and then also taking a more concrete approach uh, when it came to a Soviet American trade treaty, which was supposed to be, uh, to, to, to be um, uh, signed and ratified in uh, May, June 1990, uh, the, the Congress basically blocked the ratification of the trade treaty uh, saying that the first the Baltic issue should be, uh, if not resolved and at least somehow somehow appeased and, and, and uh, there should be some sort of a solution for the Baltic uh, situation. Uh, and the Baltic yes, for the other way, how they, 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 they uh, navigated the situation was through the letter writing uh, to, the, uh, to the White House um, and the, the White House was flooded by the uh, letters coming from the Baltic diaspora. And it is very interesting because one should think, well, they were writing and writing, but then, then and, and, and so what? Uh, but we see that um, the, in the internal uh, exchanges between the, uh, the officials at the White House, they are saying that the Baltic diaspora starts to become a real problem and that the president should do something about this. Um, and so one of the solutions was that uh, the representative of Baltic diaspora should be received at the White House. And there are two occasions when, when Bush uh, tries to, to, well, he receives the representatives of the, of the Baltic diaspora organization to the White House, but nothing substantial comes out of this because neither the, the diaspora activists are able to convince Bush to recognize the Baltic state immediately, nor he, he is not able to explain or, or to make understand his position in this situation. Very good, thank, thank you. you Brad. Yeah, very good, thank you. So um, uh, Dr. Krzysztofskegi, one of our donors and uh, most long-term friend of the Baltic Studies Program, um, he's asked, he's raised his hand and, and I'm happy to, uh, so uh, Genia or Christina, if you can, if you can include Dr. Kegi. Um, so Dr. Kegi, if you, I think if you just unmute yourself, uh, you can go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, well, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful uh, talk. Uh, and I enjoyed it and it brought back a lot of uh, very happy memories from uh, 1989 and 90. Uh, when uh, we were the, as physicians, we had that first physicians, uh, Latvian, uh, physicians Congress in Riga and marched down the streets of uh, Latvia and uh, I with uh, Bertram Sarinc and uh, several other members of Lettonia raised the flag uh, uh, on the Riga castle for the first time in 50 years and and uh, the operations we did on the high ranking uh, communists uh, indicating that uh, we were uh, <laughs> Americans but also Latvians and uh, we we're all part of that uh, uh, what I would call underground movement, but anyway, those were exciting days, and it all led to uh, you know 150 fellows uh, coming to us at here at Yale, and uh, the uh, 
Baltic Studies program that uh, we're part of uh, this afternoon. And, and so, but those are, uh, as I said, those are exciting times and, and brought back a lot of happy memories. And uh, I think I should, uh, I'm in the process of writing them, uh, some of them down and, you know, so they don't disappear in, uh, you know, kind of the fog of history. But anyway, it was fun uh, hearing you and uh, thank you very much again. Thank you, and I encourage everybody to write the, the memoirs uh, because, like, for historians, it's like a precious source. Um, and something that often people have the impression that, that, uh, that, well, historians are already writing the books, what can I bring to the table? Because everything is already in the process of writing, but that, of course, is not, not true. It's, it's, a, it's a very valuable source, so please do write the, the memoirs. Thank you, Dr. Keggy. Uh, so uh, again, let me encourage any of you that ha have uh, questions uh, for Dr. Una Bergmanet to, to please uh, send them in. Um, I have plenty of my own, but I would, I'd rather hear your questions. Um, so one, one question I have is, um, what, would you say that there was difficulty in the White House in actually perceiving what a post-Soviet Soviet Union would look like? Um, uh, as I hear you describe, and, and I, so I, I have the advantage of having a, um, an early draft of your book as well. Um, this is a question that I, that, 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 that raises for me. What did they, this might not, you know, yeah, well, I'll just, I'll just leave it there. What, what, what did they see as possible? Or, because their, strategically, their vision could not just be uh, focused on, on, on the Baltic, as important as that was at the moment yeah so the we have uh, an increasing number of different reports um from different uh, agencies of the of the u.s government trying to predict what is going to happen in the soviet union what is going the soviet union to look like um and there is an argument that there will be a general collapse um so there are several possibilities. The, the, the idea of collapse becomes stronger and stronger uh, in 1991, but it's still just one of the options. There is also uh, the idea that there will be uh, a coup d'etat, which actually at the end happened, uh, that the, the conservative forces will try to take the, the, the power in the Soviet Union. Um, there is a hope that there should be some sort of a reformed Soviet Union, and that is the hope that is kind of, it, it, it's a strong hope that survives until I think mid-November 1991, that there will be some sort of association of states, the, the, the Soviet republics, except the Baltic countries, um, that it will be a new federation, there will be a new union treaty. And that's something that Mikhail Gorbachev and even Yeltsin hoped uh, also even after the uh, August uh, coup d'etat. Um, but I think that the, the unpredictable, there is a wonderful uh, report by, written by, um, again, Brent Scopcroft, uh, who says in the report that um, it, if the uh, conservative forces in this struggle between the liberal forces and conservative forces, if the conservative forces win, it will, of course, be complicated for the United States, but then at least we will know with whom we are dealing. Well, now, and that is spring 1991, we don't really know with whom we are dealing because of this ongoing struggle. We can't really position ourselves because we don't know the outcome of the struggle. And it can be this struggle can last for years. And so we will have this very complicated situation in which we don't know who is uh, with whom we should be talking. And that must have been very frightening. Well, I, 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 assume, I assume it was uh, for everybody involved. And I think that uh, it was um, a challenging moment, situation for the White House. But I think we, and, and, I, and this is something that we should also think about the, uh, the way how it was lived and perceived by the citizens uh, of the Soviet Union in different parts of the Soviet Union, uh, not just in Baltic countries, but also in Moscow, um, and, and also in other parts of the Soviet Union. And then um, 
to a certain extent, this uncertainty about the future of the Soviet Union for uh, the rest of the international community and for the Baltic countries, it ended in 1991. There was some sort of a, um, understanding of what, what is now going to be, um, how we are going to handle the situation. While for uh, the, uh, the Russians living in Russia, or other parts of the Soviet, uh, well, the former Soviet Union, this uncertainty continued all through the 90s. And I think that's a big part of the explanation of the, of the current problems that we see in, in Russia, this, this ongoing uncertainty all through, the, all through the 90s, this feeling of one hand collapsed, but this new world and, and new institutions not really emerging. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Um, so uh, we have a, uh, a question from Anna Vinograd, you mentioned a shift from central power to peripheral power due to democratization. Did that shift remain internationally recognized even after the, de de even after the declarations of independence from the Baltic states? Um, I'm just reading uh, one more time the question that the shift to money is nationally recognized even after the Baltic states movement. Well, and I, I think that that uh, after the Baltic declarations, then the, the shift became the shift became obvious uh, with the with the elections with the in, in the case of the Baltic countries, the elections of 1990 in the spring, when the pro-independent governments um, independent pro-independent and the independence movements won the elections. And so at this point, you really, and, and that was a big question in the West, that now we have these um, governments that are elected in free elections. Um, and so we have to acknowledge their legitimacy. Um, and then by consequence, obviously we have to, to, to admit that the power dynamics in the Soviet Union have shifted. Uh, that there are other actors who are legitimacy claiming the rights to represent the, the Baltic, uh, uh, the Baltic uh, countries. So I think that that, that is really the turning point um, because before that, when, when, when the, 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 the power in, in, in Riga, Tallinn and, and Vilnius was still in the hands of the old communist guard, um, even they were also turning towards the some sort of a reform agenda, then there could be argument in the West that um, that they do not represent the the, the 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 people in the Baltic countries. But then after the elections, that it became obvious that these power dynamics have changed. Since we were putting this in the, in the broader uh, all Soviet context, the the, the question makes me. Uh, you know, wonder whether um, Mr. Vinograd is thinking about international recognition of, of just the Baltic or maybe other parts of, of, of the, uh, the first, former Soviet Union. I mean, your, your, reaches, your research is on the Soviet Union, though, that it, 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 it raises all these other issues, right, with regard to the uh, other republics and how that international recognition for the Baltic region was so different, right, even after, even after 1991 and remains so. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that is the So Una, Una uh, warned us that, she, that her sig she was worried about her signal from Helsinki. I hope she's going to be right back. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait just, uh, we'll wait a few minutes and Hopefully we'll get Una back. So yeah, just hold on with us for just a, just a couple minutes. We're um, hopefully uh, we just need Una to, to dial in, in again.
All right. Um, well, so I'm not, I'm not sure how we've lost our signal, um, but I want to thank you all. Uh, please thank you all for, for being here. And um, we will keep you apprised with our, our Baltic events.